Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you in the Lord's house on this uh, new year, new day, first day of the new year, and uh, the Lord's uh, blessing upon you. We're going to share some thoughts about uh, uh, some things we ought to resolve to do, we ought to do together from the book of Hebrews in a few minutes, but uh, it's a joy to have you here today. Um, we have a prayer request uh, that uh, from uh, Linda Abbey, her roommate there in the rehab named Patsy, has some significant health issues that she's asking us to pray for. So remember to pray for Linda as well as you, uh, uh, or as uh, for this lady, Patsy, as you do for Linda. And uh, she's had some good days of uh, uh, therapy, so uh, they're saying that's good. And so we don't know what, her, what the future is for her exactly yet, but she is trusting the Lord. And uh, thanks you. She thanks you for your prayers for her. You've got her through, she said. So uh, thank you for that. Well, let me uh, just, uh, there's not a lot of announcements here today for up and coming things, but as you notice here, the Sandy and I like to thank the congregation for their uh, generous Christmas offering to us. Thank you for that, for all the cards and gifts and uh, blessings you've given to us. We're so grateful. And so our, our uh, prayer for, for us this coming year uh, is that God would give us his presence and power to serve him together. So let's certainly pray for that. I'm glad you took the time on the first day of the year to come and be part of the, uh, the service today. I trust it will be a blessing uh, as we interact with God's word that will be helpful to you. So God's blessing upon you. It is good to see our visitors here. The Bouduches still have part of the clan here, and uh, good to have Chris and Jackie here. And uh, Emily just, she was here last week. She's just hanging out. So, hey, might as well. She said, I just, I'm not paying for that expensive ticket. I'll just wait a few days and get the cheap ticket. And that's a mathematician for you. They know that. You know, when you talk to people who uh, think that prosperity to them is going to come not the old-fashioned way through hard work and stuff, and they spend their money on the lottery and stuff, you know what What someone who, who's, who buys lottery tickets, what their problem is? They are a poor math student and figure it out. They think, I'll hit that lucky jackpot. Yeah, I think I saw that, you know, those millions and millions that are up there, that it, it, the likelihood of winning that is, is uh, greater than being hit by lightning 178 times in a row. Now, I have never been hit by it once, but 178 times zap, 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 zap. Uh, so anyway. You can thank Emily for being a strong math student. She knows how to save some dollars. And uh, I always like to tease her when she shows up. So if I didn't, she would feel like he doesn't care about me anymore. So anyhow, <laughs> we're glad to have you here today. Blessings on you. All right. Uh, I'm going to let Joe share some more. We have a uh, birthday on today, and we're going to acknowledge that in a moment. And let me make, make a mention of it. There was some confusion. We did have Sunday school today. I know last week we did not. We did have Sunday school today. Um, no evening service tonight. And do remember, Wednesday, the Kids Club is in recess. However, we are still having our multi-generational teaching. I've got some uh, special things that I do with our multi-generational class. And then we break up. And the kids go with me to pray and for their activities. And then you guys can break up in your group. So do remember, 6.30 on Wednesday, our regular time, we will be meeting here at the Lord's House for prayer meeting, Bible study. All right? And no service tonight. Okay, Brother Joe, you'll come and share something else. Good morning. Good morning. I've been told today by my daughter-in-law that this is a very nice and warm day. So you need to take that in mind that you're living in an area where it is nice and warm today. Uh, some of you don't seem to believe me, but... Let's see, Missionary of the Month, we're going to stick with Tad Wells' family, Papua New Guinea. Uh, they'll be our missionaries, so remember them, especially this month, as you pray for your missionaries. And uh, there's a financial report for last week. Sunday quote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service Romans 12 1 that's one the good one to start out the the new year and to remember and and of course the pastor has a little 
thank you note in there. And that one birthday is Hannah. Hannah, how old are you? Eight? Eight. Okay. That's what uh, time flies, but I remember when Hannah was born here. Uh, let's sing happy birthday to Hannah. great day and I'm sure you will I see there's two cakes out there for your birthday and what people are going to eat you get to eat I guess yeah all by yourself uh, anniversary the Peppins have an anniversary on the 5th January the 5th how many <laughs> I like that he wasn't the one that got the blame Anyway, they've been married quite a while. <laughs> anyway, happy anniversary to you. Want to sing happy anniversary, please? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. And many more. I think that's about it. Uh, let's see those smiles. We got, got our Christmas done, and my first uh, uh, resolution is to make it to the next, the next year. So that's always a good one, and I'll strive for that right now. Thank you. God bless. Enjoy your day. The Lord gave it to you. Use it well. All right, Brother Matt and his family are in San Antonio uh, today and uh, a little vacation, so I'm going to leave with the singing. And if I invite you to turn, please, to number 20 as you stand together to on this first day of the new year to praise the Lord. Ready together? Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, 
tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither faint when thou art rebuked of him. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Furthermore, we have had fathers our flesh which corrected us, and we have gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection of the father's spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time together this day to worship you. It is appropriate, Lord, that the very first few hours of the new year would be spent in contemplation of the greatness of our God, the works of our God, the word of our God, the power of our God. And so, Lord, it is a great opportunity that we spend this first Lord's Day, this first day of this new year with you to consider ourselves, our lives, and to remember, as the writer of Hebrews says, that we've forgotten the exhortation that speaks so well to us. The Lord loves, he chases us. We thank you, Lord, for your correcting hand in our life, for your instruction in our life. We pray that we'd be more, uh, more discerning disciples in this coming year, that we would see that which is good and we would turn away from that which is evil. It would help us and uh, that, our, that we would be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And even today, Lord, would you begin that process? Sometimes we refer to the things we want to do as resolutions at this time of the year, but sometimes they don't really come to pass. And Lord, help us to follow the admonitions in this book of Hebrews as we consider them in a few moments to do the things that will matter for eternity. I pray for every soul today. You encourage every heart, one the hearts that are are fainting, are, are discouraged. I pray, Lord, you would lift them up in you and for if there's anyone without Christ, that they would please respond to the gospel and turn to that Savior who lovingly gave himself for them on the cross. So bless our worship today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn, please, now to 524. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. 524. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save my sins are all. And my guilt is all gone. Save, save. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. 
Saved by the blood of the crucified one. The angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father, joined heir with the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Save, save. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen, is that true? Okay, I'll give you another chance. Are you saved by the blood of the crucified one? Amen. That's right. Okay, good. Your first amen of the new year. Did it feel good to get it out? Great. Let's stand together. We have an opportunity to now to thank the Lord for this new year, for all his blessings, and we'll do that as we turn to 622 in our greeting chorus. I invite you to stand, please. So we receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. 622. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me my great salvation so rich and free. All right, turn around and welcome, folks. Let's sing it again. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Amen. For those of you who did not know, uh, Carolyn Pace is in the United States now. Uh, her sister passed away, and she came in for 
the funeral, I believe, in North Carolina. She will be traveling to some of the churches since the, it's only been five, six weeks since Tom passed, uh, but she's going to be sharing about the ministry there in Lima. Uh, she'll be with us sometime the end of January or the first part of February, just depends on what her schedule allows. So we're looking forward to hearing from her, but please uh, keep her in prayer. Uh, they've had a lot of loss this year, and uh, we understand that as a church too, don't we? I was telling the Sunday school class uh, back in 2022, the first day of 2022, we would not have envisioned that we would be losing uh, either directly or indirectly seven seven of our congregation. And so it's uh, been a rough, rough time for loss. And so we understand that, but in the midst of that, we can praise the Lord for his goodness and uh, the blessing that he's been to our Let's continue to thank him for that. Let's uh, thank him for the provision for our missionaries and for the work of ministry here. And uh, Brother Carl, would you mind praying for the offering, please, brother? Amen. You may be seated. Another thing to thank the Lord for, our uh, baby grand piano over there, and uh, we're grateful for that, for vision of the Lord. Well, I invite you to turn in your symbols to number 478, 478. Let's stand together, shall we? Well, you may be seated. I'll, I'll have you stand on the next song, all right? 478, it is well with my soul. Sing with me, please. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet Though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. 
my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious spot. I sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Now would you stand please on the last verse. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. May that be the case in our lives this year. 445, if you'll turn over there. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse of standing on the promises of God. We have the eternal word of God. We can hold it in our hands. We can study it. We can memorize it. We can share it. And we can have it bless us. And so this year, let's use that promise of God that He, his word will never return void in our lives as we sing 445, Standing on the Promises. All together now. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. On the last verse. Standing on the promises I cannot fail, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate that spirit of worship as we have shared music, and thank you for playing. Joy for us. Appreciate it. I always told Joy that I like the way she plays the piano. It's happy. So, not that everyone else doesn't play happy too. It's just that's what I notice about it. So, it's a new year, right? And did anyone stay up and watch the ball fall? It's only 10 o'clock our time, but I mean, it wasn't a real sacrifice. Anyone watch that fall down? How many? 
How many millions of dollars did that cost to put those lights together? I saw them, you know, those little triangles of glass, and then it, it's all LED now, so it does all the different colors. I saw that. They were interrupting football game ball with, for that, you know, and I was just, I just couldn't understand why they would do that. But anyway, I saw some parts of it, but I didn't watch it fall down. <clears throat> Instead, I watched, uh, what was it, right at the last at 10 o'clock midnight, uh, Georgia won just by a little bit. It was just so exciting to see how this was so delighted. Brother, is he ready to text him? Bad, you know, maybe next year sort of thing, but uh, they turned they turned it around. And I don't know if Paul stayed up till midnight. <clears throat> he's a servant of the Lord. He has to work, and he works in a, he's a music minister, assistant pastor in church. He serves, and so uh, I think he stayed up till midnight to see the whole game. But then in Georgia, that's different, you know. Go dogs, all that stuff. And so anyway, so football has has uh, <clears throat> arisen on the first uh, last day of the year, and it will continue doing so for another. My wife says, is it over yet? Over yet? I said, just one more. It's next Monday night, you know, 5.30. It'll start in, in, in Mountain Standard Time. And the championship game will be played by Texas Christian University versus the Georgia Bulldogs. It will be just a moment to remember <clears throat> until you forget two days later we will play. That's sort of how it goes with our resolutions, too, is, oh, I'm so excited about this first of the new year. I want things to happen. Things are going to be different. I'm going to make some changes and so on. And after a bit, we forget about it. Well, a fellow by the name of Christopher Flannery writes for the Imprimis magazine. Uh, and he had a little, had some thoughts that I thought were significant here about uh, resolutions and what we ought to do. And, and by the way, I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 as we come to that. So here's what he has to say. I thought it was kind of <clears throat> significant. He said, New Year's Day is the morning of the year. He says, like the morning of mere days, it inspires fresh hope. But on an immensely grander scale, each morning we wake after disappearing in sleep for a split second of eternity, surprised again to find ourselves still here. Like strong coffee, coffee, the discovery is rejuvenating. Then we reflect that we have once again successfully spun around the Earth's axis. If we're at a northern uh, latitude, somewhere between Santa Fe and Cheyenne, Wyoming, we have traveled 20,000 miles since yesterday, just spinning from day to night and back to day. We begin to wonder at ourselves and take on small but innocent airs. When we further reflect that without batting an eye or breaking a sweat, we have rocketed over a million and a half miles in our orbit around the sun since this time uh, a day ago, and that we are now going to start over and perform the same mysteries and miracles again in a mere 24 hours, we become almost tempted to the sin of pride. So it is every New Year's Day, but on a scale at least 365 times more inspiring, now we reflect that just in our daily rotations, we have spun over 7 million miles since last year. And in our orbiting, we have sailed an unthinkable 568 million miles through space. Did you realize you did that? You did. Once again, astonishingly and without mishap, Leaving aside the odd war, depression, or plague, we have revolved uh, around the sun and come back to where we started to begin anew. Winter has turned to spring, spring to fall, and back to winter. It's a new year with no mistakes in it. The world is ours to conquer, and this no doubt is what inspired the ancient custom of New Year's resolutions. Now, he goes on for several pages in, in uh, PhD language to explain the resolutions, but a couple thoughts came out to me that I wanted to share with you. He says, uh, inspired by the miracle of the new year, we sense anew, as Thomas Jefferson put it, that Almighty God hath created the mind free, that this freedom of mind equips and therefore obliges us to seek the truth that we should be guided by, that all nobility, all that is worthwhile in life, depends on finding this truth and living by it. And failing to 
seek it with all our heart, mind, soul, is, let it, is to let our lives slip through our fingers like water. Easy for that to happen. It's easy for us to sort of forget about that. And so he speaks about Benjamin Franklin and his thoughts about it. Let me share what he says about him. He says, uh, Benjamin Franklin once conceived this, the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. That's what he believed about uh, resolutions. Like most of us, he thought he knew well enough what was uh, right and wrong and saw no reason why he shouldn't be able always to do the one and avoid the other. Oh, and you're just rationally thinking it out. That seems to make sense, right? He soon found that it was not as easy as he supposed it would be. On further reflection, it occurred to him that his efforts to achieve perfection might even be what he laughingly called a kind of foppery in morals. Still, looking back on his efforts, he was confident that they had made him a better and happier man than he otherwise would have been. So it is, I think, with our New Year's resolutions. Even if we fall short, we are better men and women for having resolved to try. Resolution, in fact, was one of the virtues Franklin listed among a dozen others he aspired to acquire in his effort to achieve moral perfection. If you think you're going to do it, you listen to what Benjamin Franklin found out. He defined resolution this way, resolve to perform what you ought. Sounds like him. Penny saved, it's a penny earned, et cetera, et cetera. You know, poor man's almanac, Richard's almanac. Sounds like a, a, a wise statement. Resolve to perform what you ought. Just do the right thing. Oh, he found out it's not that easy. Perform without fail what you resolve. Okay, that's simple too. Do what you say and then do it. Make what you say something that we you should do. And by the way, be careful. In, in Sunday school, we did discover in Ecclesiastes 5 that Solomon, wisest man, right? said this, he said, when you make a vow to God, defer not to pay it. You make a request of God, it is better for you not to vow than to vow a vow and not to, to pay it because God has no delight in fools. Because he doesn't want you to make all these rash decisions. You should take your time. He says, when you come to the house of God, be careful when you come in. Be more ready to listen than to speak. And be careful that you are not rash with your tongue in telling God what you will do and so forth and so on. And so Franklin goes on with that. And that it was, it was precisely this that he found most hard to do. And failing at this, failing at doing what he said he would do, failing at it, he could not achieve temperance or justice or moderation or any of the other virtues on his list aspirational list. I want to do this, I want to do that. But he couldn't do the first one, which was, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. He had it in a nutshell. How long ago was Franklin around? The founding of our country, 200 and something years. What has changed? Nothing. It's the same problem, the same issue. We resolve to know that we, we should. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. We know the Scripture's teaching that we should follow after righteousness and true holiness, and that we should live a life a certain way, and and we find ourselves incapable of doing that. In and of ourselves, it's never going to happen. And so the ability to reach moral perfection, however, by the way, Franklin was defining that for himself. He was taking a lot of virtues that he knew to be good from biblical truth, but he was defining them himself and therefore setting his own standard that he couldn't quite keep by himself, which is exactly what the Bible tells us. The law came to reveal the fact that we are sinners. The law of God was not something that is held up for you to be able to attain, to keep it. And Jesus said it was very clear that the Pharisees of his day in Matthew 5 and 6 were not keeping the law. You have heard it said of them of old time, don't do this, but I say unto you, here's what the standard of the law really is. Everyone's defined it themselves. And so what do they have? They have a, a set of righteousness that is far lower than the righteousness of God. And Jesus said in that passage, except your righteousness exceed 
the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. How can we do better than those guys? Their job is to stand around being holy. We can't do that. We're not going to make it. And of course, the whole point was, of course you can't make it. The law brought about death. But Jesus Christ brought about righteousness. He came to destroy the law. And a whole group of people, Jews, part of the diaspora, the, those scattered abroad that Peter spoke of in his epistle, and that the writer of Hebrews is speaking about, a whole bunch of them, those folks were looking at the value of Christianity and they were putting it and, and comparing it to the value of, of their tradition of, the, of Judaism. And the problem with it is they could never reach a standard that was true righteousness because they were sinners. And a sinner can never in his own mind determine what is true and righteous to meet this, the, the qualifications for God to let you into heaven. This can't be done. And so the Bible says that he who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. And so Christ comes along and he says, you'll never keep the standard God has set by yourself, and therefore you need another standard, and that'll be an eternal one that you will get through my sacrifice on the cross. And that Holy Spirit who comes to indwell you will, uh, will chase you as we read in our Scripture from chapter 12, he will bring about chastening. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He scourges every son whom he receives. He says, and no chasing for the present time seems to be joyous, but grievous. It's not pleasant to go through training and instruction by the Lord. Sometimes his hand is heavy upon us, for he has a lot of rough places to, to, to sand down in our lives. When that happens, it's not grievous. But after uh, it's joy, joyous afterwards. It it. It brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised thereby. In other words, it's an exercise. We're going to do a spiritual exercise today from Hebrews and just a few thoughts from it. By the way, I have an entire list for you. I'm not going to go through it. There's 12 of them, I think, on the list. And you say, oh, I can't do 12 this morning. It's a new debt year. Come on, have mercy on us. I am. I'm going to have mercy on you. If you would like the entire list, then I will reproduce it for you. I'll hand it to you. If you're just going to throw it in the trash can, then don't ask for it. But if you want a list to help you uh, with some of your resolutions that are based on some scriptural principles, then you can have it. But for this morning, we're just going to talk about a few of them. See, the issue of the, the writing of Hebrews to these Jews was basically to help them to mature and to grow in grace and knowledge. They were having struggles with that. Um, they thought that uh, the law should come in somewhere in some place, and sometimes they were evaluating it. So we have the writer of Hebrews saying that Jesus Christ is better than, than angels, and Jesus Christ is better than Moses, and uh, uh, Jesus Christ is better than the, the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, because Jesus Christ is from the Melchizedek priesthood. By the way, the writer of Hebrews says, if you want strong meat, Strong meat belongs to them that are full age. When you're talking about the things that are serious and intense in the Word of God for those that are mature, strong meat belongs to them that are full age, some of those who are grown, even those who by reason of use have their senses, here's that word again, exercised to discern good and evil. Hey, I'll tell you what God will do to mature you. He will exercise you. He will exercise you through His chastening hand, and when we say chastening, we always think that he means spanking, and it's not so. Chastening is basically correction. It is correction, and sometimes it feels like a spanking, and sometimes it's just you're off the mark a little bit, push you over here. And so uh, it's not just always a spanking. Don't get that negative connotation. Besides, it says, you've forgotten the exhortation that speaketh unto you, whom the Lord loveth he chases. He's doing this because he's doing good. And so everything that he allows in your life is ultimately going to work together for good. Romans 8, 28 says, all things are working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so this new year, whatever happens, is going to work together for good. Now, as I told you, 2022, seven people, some directly, some indirectly. 
But our, our church was impacted by that, seven deaths. And we would say, that's not good, preacher. No, death is not a good thing. We know that it is defanged. Where's thy sting death? Where's thy, the, the, you know, uh, where's the victory of the grave? No, no longer is it because Christ has done it, but there's still pain. There's still suffering. And though we lose people, we don't sorrow as others that have no hope. It doesn't say we don't sorrow. And the Bible doesn't say that death is something good and that all things are good. It says all things work together for good. So there's the process that God is doing. As he's exercising me, he'll say, now, Zahn, here's some good things that are going to happen in your life. They're going to be masquerading as challenges or, as I would put it, terrible, depressing trials, you know, whatever it might be. When I talk about my terrible, distressing trials to someone else, they'll go, oh, yeah, I, okay, that happened to me some time ago. Yeah, it was nothing. <laughs> and to me, it's terrible, distressing trials. Do you get what I'm saying? you got terrible, distressing trials? Guess what? God says, now, I want you to look at this differently because I'm exercising you. Um, how many ever going to do some exercises for the new year? Right? I mean more than pushing the remote. I'm practicing on my remote thing. But they, they wouldn't put two different ball, bowl games at different times, would they? Where I couldn't watch the college bowl games at the same time. That, that would be just torture. That would be bad. I can't multitask like that. So, no, I'm talking about some serious exercising. You're going to do it. You know what happens with that? You're going to be tempted because of the pain that it brings about. Oh, you haven't done any exercises for all fall, and we forgot about it. Now it's January, and it's cold outside, so I'm going to walk around the block. Oh, boy, and i got to put on all my stuff. And you take that, those first steps, and especially if it's not like me, you've got knee issues, and, oh, it hurts. It's, it needs to. But after a while, hey, after a while, it's used to it. So it's painful at first, and that will make you turn away. So when God is correcting and changing things, in your life, you're tending to say, backing off, that hurts too much. No, I don't want to do it. Yeah, but God says, no, you need to do it. So you get to go through that. And then he exercises you with the things that are important in God's word. Uh, you can discern good and evil. You don't want to know what's right and wrong. Uh, ben Franklin, I think he might have had some connection with the Bible. I don't want to put too much spirituality in some of these forefathers. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, he seems to have had but the truth is, where do we get the view of right and wrong? Where do we get that impression that this is what I should do, what I ought to do, it's going to make me a better man, a better person? Uh, we get it from the Bible. And so how do you understand what is good, what is evil? You have to exercise yourself in the Word of God. And so it's important that we do that. And that is what was the writer was trying to get the Hebrews to do. She said, look, he says, you need to go on to maturity. This process of maturing you in your faith takes time. It takes daily commitment, uh, and it takes uh, service to produce maturity. It's not just what you take in, it's what you give out. And so it is a whole process. Breathe in the Word of God. Breathe out service to others, right? Hey, the first thing you're going to do with exercising, learn to breathe. Well, they tell you, if you don't out your mouth. Those breathing. And then those stretching exercises. Oh, they want to twist you like a pretzel. My arm hurts. My knee hurts. I don't like it. Well, but there's something good that's going to come from it. All right? Now, a couple things, and I'm going to let you go. I'll let you go with a couple things and admonitions. Now, just since I'm not doing the whole 12, if you wanted to, you could write these few on the back of your bulletin if you wanted to. And they all begin with an exhortation. That's what makes it easy to find them in the book of Hebrews, because they all start out with, let us, let us do it. Jefferson said, let us do this. Franklin says, let's go forward, resolve to do it, and then do it. Resolving and doing are two different things. It's going to be easy to change moral perfection. No, it's not. What do we do? Well, let us. It is a collective issue. Can you do it with me? Can we all do it together? Sure. So they're found in chapter 4 of Hebrews, real close together. Look at verse 1. There's your admonition, exhortive command. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us 
of entering into rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Here's your first item on your list to resolve. Let us therefore fear. Now, the fear that uh, in this context is referring to these groups of, of Hebrews that were evaluating Christ and maybe making some thoughts toward, yes, that's better than Judaism, but maybe weren't completely to the place of accepting Christ as Savior and Lord. That's a possible interpretation here. So here the fear is this, that you're not going to get the rest that he's speaking about, and you have to read uh, chapter 3 through and chapter five, uh, uh, 4 through in order to get that idea of the rest. But it's talking about the rest God promised his people, an eternal rest, the rest of the being in the land. But he says, this rest didn't happen to some because unbelief pulled them away. And so now I want you not to be fall into that trap. Therefore, let us fear lest a promise being left unto us, entering into the rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Here's the thing I want to encourage you, believer in Christ, is that we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. When I'm saying that, I don't mean the, 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 the phobia fear, though that's the word that is used here. It has the idea that Phobos word has the idea of being afraid, like startled, but it has beyond that, the idea of, of, uh, of awe. You're just struck by the awesomeness of something. And usually it's the works of God. When you go and visit someplace, like I've never been to Niagara Falls. I know people up north have been there. I've never seen Niagara Falls, but I hear, yeah, it's awesome. The missionaries have been there say, yeah, you go out on a boat and you have to wear a raincoat. You get close to it, it'll just spray all over you. And it's really cool. And part of it's in Canada and part of it's in the United States. I don't understand how exactly that works, but hey, uh, I haven't been up there. But I hear it's just a fearful experience. Thinking of all that water coming over, and they talk about the zillions of gallons that are coming across every day. Oh, man, it, it would be just an immense, uh, uh, you know, fearful thing. It's awesome. That's what God is. He's awesome. In Psalm 2, when God is talking about setting his son upon his kingdom, and the heathen are saying, we don't want him. We're going to cast his cords asunder, break his bands asunder, cast his cords from us. God in heaven, he laughs at that. He says, oh, I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I've made the decree that he is, this is my son. This day have I begotten thee. And son, ask of me, I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. The other most parts of the earth for thy possession. That's the kind of God we're talking about. He sets up one, he puts down another, and he says to the to the, uh, those who are standing against him, you'll not stop me from setting my king upon mine. I'm giving him a rod of iron. He can dash you like a potter's vessel. In the next chapter, chapter 3 of the Psalms, the psalmist speaks about the God breaking the cheekbone ah, of the ungodly and knocking out their teeth. You say, oh, that's so violent. Yeah, sin is a consequence of sin is a violent thing. It's an awful thing. And, and the destruction of the wicked, as God speaks about it, sometimes it is, a, a, is very, uh, you know, uh, colorful. You'll see it. You can feel it. You can get the tension of it. And the issue is here that they didn't fear him. Because you chose not to follow the ways of the Lord and chose not his fear. You didn't walk in his fear. We don't have that today. Psalm 2, when he finishes that up, he says, Now fear the Lord and rejoice with trembling. Ye kings of the earth, ye judges, you watch, you pay attention. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. It's time to get fearful with God. So if we enter into this year with a holy reverence before God, that means we are fearful of displeasing him. He's the one who has all power. All power, Jesus said, and when he was resurrected, is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore into all nations. In, in all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and teaching them whatsoever things I have uh, shown unto you. And lo, I will be with you always to the end of the earth. And so Jesus is here today uh, uh, approving or disproving the words that come from this mouth by this book. And he's here today uh, evaluating you. The eyes of the Lord walk to and fro throughout the earth to find a person whose heart is perfect toward him. He's looking towards you right now. See, how is this new year going to work for you? Will you be exercised by the things that are necessary? My correction, will you receive it? Will you remember it? Will you allow the word of God to mature you so you can understand 
good and evil. Fear. Fear missing the blessing. Stand in reverence awe of God so you do not have his displeasure upon you. Now look down at verse number 11. Oh, another one of them. Let us, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. In other words, if you say you're a believer in Christ, then start living like it. Labor that way. Don't fall. Don't pull yourself aside. As you said, the, the chastening is hard, and so you pull yourself away. The instruction of the Word of God, it's difficult because you have to realign some priorities in your life with God, and that's something you maybe don't want to do. In which case, it comes to the issue of laboring. And it seems to be contradictory, labor to enter into rest. But it's not contradictory at all. You serve Christ because you are going to that rest, not to get there. I'm not serving Christ so I can get to heaven. He saved me way back when I was 15 years old. By his grace, I understood that I had nothing to offer him and other than my sin. And he said, I will take that and I will exchange it. I who knew no sin, uh, I will give my, you my righteousness, will trade. And he took my sins upon himself. And he gave me his righteousness. And therefore, my righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who thought they could reach moral perfection with their own workings. Can't do it. My righteousness is of a different quality. It's the righteousness of God. Put upon me. You see, that's pretty arrogant to say. No, it's biblical to say. It's it perfectly uh, the place of humility to say, I didn't do it. If I would boast about it, then I would be violating Ephesians 2. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So right away, I know I'm not supposed to boast. Right away, I know it's all of grace. And so I come before him with what? Reverent fear of who he is. And I'm laboring to enter into that rest. Not that I could, that's going to get me in, but because I'm going, I want to be there. I'm going to be part of that. And so, Lord, I'm going to serve you here so I can be the best servant I can be entering into that rest. Look down to verse 14. Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, there it is again. Let us hold fast our profession. Hold on. Hold on. Who do I see? I have a great high priest. What did the priest do? He interceded for the people. Uh, on that one day of the year, the high priest. Now, the other priests would take the offerings. The Levites would be working around and, and handling some of the more menial things, but the, 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 uh, uh, the, the priests themselves who were in the order of Aaron, they basically followed all this stuff. They take your sacrifice. But there was one guy who was the high priest. And that guy's job once a year was to go into the Holy of Holies to make intercession for the entire nation. And on that day, he went in and out, in and out, in and out. You read the scriptures. He didn't just go in one time. He went in, in and out several times, uh, all figuring something distinct and different. But it always came with this issue of blood, with the sacrifice, with that which was, was uh, for the atonement in the Old Testament. Jesus entered into that holy place once for all, the Bible says. Didn't have to keep doing it uh, in that one day several, several times, and then every year repeated again, several, several times, every year repeated again. Uh, Jesus went once in. He entered into the holy place, and you now have access. When you're holding on to something, understand that you're being held on by some someone greater. God is holding you. That great high priest who sacrificed himself for you is holding on to you. Peter put it this way. He talked about that that uh, uh, we we have uh, this, this uh, um, he didn't use the term high priest. Peter spoke about the, the issue of the, the salvation of the of the blood of Christ being much more precious than gold that perisheth. And he talked about the fact that this faith that you have, uh, it, it's, it's uh, uh, though it's tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor of appearing of Jesus Christ, and that you are held by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last times. You're kept by God's power. And so when we hold on, it's like, 
it, it, it's insignificant compared to what's holding us up. I'm going to hold on to God, and so I think of all this, the effort I have to use. No, the effort is on God's part to hold you up. I use illustration from time to time of my hulking, monstrous son now, six foot something. And Anyway, when he was a little guy, oh, he's just a skinny zons, all this arms and legs. So uh, he was a little guy, and he said, I'm going to get you, Dad. I said, okay, come and try. So he'd come and try and get me, and I would grab him by his ankle, and I'd flip him upside down. You know, here he is dangling with his arms, his arms. And occasionally, he would reach enough to get my leg. He says, I've got you now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Who's holding who? When he was little, he would come up with his arms, hold you. I hold you. Okay. I'm like, you hold me. I gather him up. Something was going on in his life. He just wanted to be held or he was unhappy. But he would, oh, I hold you. I hold you. Come here. Are you holding me now? Yeah. No, he wasn't holding me. I was holding him. When you cry out to God, I, that's the same thing you're doing. I hold you. I hold you. You need his presence. And what does the Lord do? He comes down and sweeps down, and he picks you up in his arms, and he holds you. People have lost loved ones this year. And I can remember in several instances talking about the praying for them that the great arms of God, the everlasting arms, would uphold this family, this person, these times. That's what it means to hold on. I'm not holding on to him. He's holding on to me. By the way, if you wanted another one of those, as Hebrews 10, 23, this doesn't cost any extra. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. There in chapter 10, another one of those exhortations, let us. He's a faithful God. He's the one who's keeping covenant promise. You're going to fail him. You are not going to keep those resolutions, especially the dietary ones know by experience. But guess what? He who's called you is faithful. He says, I've made a covenant promise through my son. I've set him on my holy hill. He's the one who's ruling. And he says, I will keep that promise for you, Mark Zahn. You can't keep your promises to me, but I can keep mine to you. So I'm going to hold on to you now. I want you to hold on to me. That's what that's about. All right, one last one in chapter four here, and we'll be done. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Get close to God. Get close to him. Let us draw near. So how do you, how do you get near to God? Well, we recognize the other things. There's the fearfulness of God in his presence. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. That's Hebrews 10, 31. He says, God is a fearful God. God is a holy God. God is a righteous God. I'm not. So what do I do? Oh, well, we get in the righteous condition through salvation in Christ first, That, but day by day as we create sins and our old nature battles with us, uh, we pray what, what John said. He said, uh, uh, to come to God, he says, he, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us from all sins if we confess our sins. And he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess those sins, guess what? God comes near. We have an advocate, chapter 2 says, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation, the mercy seat. He's the place of the Holy of Holies that right here Hebrews is talking about. You can go in to the throne of grace. What does that mean? That means you're right into the very presence of the presence of God in that holy place where the cherubim are guarding the Ark of the Covenant, guarding the mercy seat. And there you are. You can come right in. And Galatians says you can cry out, Abba, Father. He's close to you. He's near to you. He's looking for that sincere heart, not the perfect heart, not the, the one who's reached moral perfection with my resolutions. No, the one who says, I'm weak, I'm sinful, but I've been forgiven, Lord, and I ask for your help. Guess what? God says, that sacrifice I love, that broken and contrite heart, I'll not despise. And so he draws near. So he invites you to come first. Draw near with a true heart of confession. Make that true. 
sprinkled, uh, your hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, your bodies washed with pure water. The water of the word cleanses us, makes us pure, makes us clean. We can come before him. Well, I don't know what your resolution is going to look like this year exactly. I'm sure you're even going to do those. But we ought to take some stock and evaluate spiritually where we are. These thoughts in Hebrews can be a start to help us. So what are we going to do? We're going to fear him. We're going to labor to then rest. We're going to hold on, and we're going to come boldly and find grace in time of need. And so starting the new year out a good way today, folks. Thank you for being here. May God conceal the truth of his word to our hearts today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your graciousness and kindness to us through this last year. The Lord, we failed you so many times, and yet you abide faithful. And so as we come to this new year, we'll let us resolve to do some things. Oh, not in the promises of our flesh, but in the power of your spirit. Perhaps, Lord, we need to talk to you about some issues in our life that we are facing. We're afraid to do it because when they're going to look weak and we're going to look sinful, but we already know that's what we are, Lord. Why do we think we can hide it from you? We know that if we come clean with you and we confess those things, you're just and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So grant us your help today, Lord. As we look to this year, we don't know what it will bring. We don't know what the challenges will be. We know there will be some correction for our lives. We know there will be some instruction from the Word. So, Father, let us go forward with these thoughts today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you would take your hymnals, we have a final hymn. And actually, it's uh, 387, I Will Follow. I Will Follow is number 387. So you stand with me, please. Thank you.